Hello, and welcome to the Evidence-Based Exercise Rehabilitation and Sport Performance channel. This channel is for the healthcare movement professional looking to incorporate applied research concepts into their current practice setting. Today's topic, CNS Operation of Eccentric Contraction. The objectives of this discussion are to discuss the differences in CNS muscular operating strategies utilized across eccentric and concentric contraction types, and to provide a means by which you can utilize a contraction type strategy into your own programming or setting. Today we'll be highlighting reported outcomes by Fang et al. that relate to the unique neuromuscular control strategies utilized by the CNS during the creation and operation of musculoskeletal contraction. Please note there are additional outcomes performed in this study that we'll not be discussing since they are centered around other topics. So in taking a closer look at this study, in accordance to the Oxford Center for Evidence-Based Medicine, this study is a randomized control trial and falls under the category of level 2 evidence. In order to summarize things, I've taken and extracted the programming components that were used in this study. So you'll see that we had eight healthy right-handed volunteers between the ages of 20 and 44 years. The area that was studied was the biceps brachii and brachioradialis. What they did was they took 10% of the individual's body weight and had them perform two sets of 50 repetitions. One of these sets consisted of 50 concentric contractions. The other was 50 eccentric contractions. Which set was done first was completely randomized. Between each rep, the participant performed a five second hold, and between the sets, the individual was given a five minute rest. The strategy that they were looking at, they wanted to determine whether EEG measured brain activity associated with eccentric contractions of the elbow flexor muscles differs from that related to concentric contractions. Now let's take a look at our statistical results. The authors utilize measures of MRCP. This stands for Movement Related Cortical Potentials. These can either be negative or positive. The MRCP negative values, which are related to cortical activities for movement preparation and execution, were greater in the eccentric tasks than the concentric outcomes. MRCP positive values, which are associated with the processing of sensory motor feedback signaling, were greater during the eccentric than the concentric tasks as well. And lastly, the values of the negative potential onset time, which can be described as the latency from the beginning of the cortical activity until the onset of muscle activation, this amount of time for the eccentric contraction was significantly longer than for the concentric contraction. For those of you who typically skip the stats section in an article, I'd like to take a moment and help you make more sense of this information from a clinical application standpoint. Let's begin with power. Power can be defined as having a sample size that is adequate enough to detect a difference. In this case, we found a difference. So that means this study had an adequate power. Remember, your sample is representative of the greater population. If your sample size is too small, the ability to detect a difference when a true difference exists will be diminished. A power reported at 0.8 or higher is considered acceptable. Let's move on to effect size. In this study, no effect sizes were reported. The effect size would indicate the percentage of participants in the eccentric training group that would experience a similar outcome as those in the concentric training group. What the effect size helps us to understand is the proportion of eccentric group participants that scored in the same range as the concentric group. In other words, effect size tells us how large or small this proportion is. Lastly we have the 95% confidence intervals. Again, in this study, these were not reported to. The 95% confidence intervals would provide us with a range of scores that we could estimate the greater population would fall into 95% of the time. 
This is assuming that we have the same conditions, use the same parameters, and we're providing this study to the same individuals from the same demographic. A working range provides the clinician with how much variance they could potentially expect when the intervention is applied to those in the greater population. Once again, it's time for Clinical Gems! All right, all right, all right. So, what clinical gems are we walking away with today? Let's have a look at the evidence-based truths this article provides. First, as compared to concentric contraction, eccentric contraction produces greater levels of the following. Movement preparation, planning and execution, feedback signal processing, and earlier onset times. Additionally, the brain plans and processes eccentric related movement differently from concentric movement. So now that we've gone through our evidence-based truths, what kind of strategies can we use to apply these to the body? So what we want to do here is obtain a greater brain-based output through the use of eccentric contraction. So we're focusing on a specific type of muscle contraction as opposed to an exercise. That's very important. Take a moment right now and think, when you design exercises, do you focus around one type of contraction? Do you try to use all types of contraction? Do you understand what each type of contraction can actually give you? These are important questions. So let's take an easy exercise that we're all familiar with, an anterior lunge. We're simply stepping forward. How can we increase the amount of eccentric load in the front leg during this specific movement pattern? We could increase the depth that the person goes into the pattern. We could increase the horizontal distance covered. We could perform in a different plane of motion. We could perform having the individual facing downhill on a slanted surface. If we're going to do like a step down type movement, we could increase the vertical height that we're stepping down from. And lastly, some of the easiest things to look at and utilize are going to be the functional patterns that revolve around our goals. So maybe you want to take and you want to work on the eccentric phase of a stand to sit, or you want to work on the eccentric phase of a anterior hip hinge type movement, or maybe something that's more functional and athletic like the cocking phase of a baseball throw. What's important here is that you recognize the difference between a strategy and an exercise. Everything that I have given you on this slide is a strategy. It is a way to apply it to the body. Notice there are no names of specific exercises in my set of six bullet points here. Very, very important to know the difference between those two things. Now before we just start applying eccentric exercise to the individuals that we work with, we need to have a thorough understanding of what these things can and cannot give us. Do not just randomly throw eccentric exercise into the mix. Design with a purpose. Ask yourself, why would I use this type of contraction? What am I expecting will happen? How will this help us achieve a greater goal? In order to determine the effectiveness of this type of exercise or any exercise, you need some kind of measurable outcome to determine how effective the design and the programming actually was. And lastly, as previously stated, how is all of this going to address the end game? What are you trying to do for your patient or client? What are their goals? Here at the channel, we're dedicated to establish and foster a positive interprofessional environment in which learning can occur regardless of your profession and or previous training. If you're a healthcare movement professional looking to incorporate more evidence-based research application into your practice, please subscribe and join our community, where the number one goal is improving the lives of those we serve. Stay tuned. In the next video, We'll be looking at some research that is aimed at creating neuroplastic changes and movement patterning. Thanks for hanging out with us today. See you next time.